popular. Uh, has more friends. We need, we need some more folks over here. We need some guys. We have some chairs over here. Glad we got the train out of the way. Did you all hear that? That was, that was excellent. Yeah, the first one. We've been warned that maybe occasionally there might be up to four on a Sunday morning. So today could be the day. <laughs> Welcome to Evergreen. I'm glad you're here. Welcome especially if this is your first time visiting with us. We are uh, glad that you're part of our community this morning. One of the ways that we talk about community and how we live is that we strive to live in three different dimensions, three different directions. And strive to balance those in our lives. And those three are the, the up, the in, and the out. And up is that direction, that dimension of life where we are relating to God in worship and in prayer. In is that dimension or area of life in which we are relating to community. And we are drawing close to others who are walking the same path as us. And out is that direction, that dimension in which we are spending time serving uh, building relationship with people who are not part of our community, people who do not know, uh, maybe do not know Jesus, who need uh, communities of faith to serve them. Uh, if we go down to Home PDX, we, we serve the homeless in that way. There's a lot of different things we do. It kind of falls into that up, that outward kind of uh, aspect of our life together. So as as you are getting to know the community as you are being involved, uh, we'd love for you to think about those three areas of up, in, and out, and how each of them plays out in your life, how each of them is a part of your life, and whether they're in balance. Is there a place in which you say, well, maybe I have, uh, I'm all about community, and I'm all about serving others, but I kind of, I'm a little bit lacking in, in the area of worship and prayer. That's not really a reality in my life. Well, that's something to think about. Or maybe if you grew up in an evangelical church, like I did, uh, you have, you're all about the up and the in. You know those really well. It's the out that is a challenge for you. It's, it's getting outside the walls of church community that is, is really outside of the zone. In any event, we try to uh, balance those things in the life of our church and, and make opportunities for all those. And, and one of the reasons we are here this morning is for that up dimension of our lives, to center our hearts and our minds on God, to spend time in worship, in prayer, to hear from Him through His Word. So I'm glad that you're here to do that with us. If you are new, we have these green cards in the back, uh, on this back table here. We'd love for you to fill one of those out. Just let us know that you were here. Um, that way we can get you some information on the community. There's also an offering box for those who want to support the work of the community. And uh, other than that, we're just going to take a moment to say hi to the people around us. And uh, then we'll, we'll get back together and we will uh, move on with our morning. So why don't you stand up and say hi to somebody? Hi, <laughs> I don't think right now I'm in the 
on Sunday mornings anyways right now, so it's not even... Did you like grow up in a church or anything like that? Or you... Probably, yeah, in Catholic church. Uh, his parents are pretty devout. Oh, okay.
The struggle is rather between justice and injustice, between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. And if there is a victory, it will be a victory, not be a victory merely for 50,000 Negroes, but it will be a victory for justice, a victory for goodwill, a victory for democracy. Another basic thing we had to get over is, the, is that nonviolent resistance is also an internal matter. It not only avoids external violence or external physical violence, but also internal violence of spirit. And so at the center of our movement stood the philosophy of love. And he goes on uh, through the content of the body of his speech to describe the, the difference biblically of three different kinds of love using the Greek terms uh, eros, philia, and agape. And he camps and makes clear that it is the love of God working in the minds of men that really that is at the center of the civil rights movement. I'd like to read the last paragraph, which I thought was a brilliant uh, explanation of something that I, 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 I think you will hear some of the inspiration of the I Have a Dream speech that eventually, I mean, that he gave years later. Modern psychology has a word that is probably used more than any other word. It is the word maladjusted. Now, we all should seek to live a well-adjusted life in order to avoid neurotic and schizophrenic personalities. But there are some things within our social order to which I am proud to be maladjusted and to which I call upon you to be maladjusted. I never intend to adjust myself to segregation and discrimination. I never intend to adjust myself to mob rule. I never intend to adjust myself to the tragic effects of the methods of physical violence and to tragic militarism. I call upon you to be maladjusted to such things. I call upon you to be as maladjusted as Amos, who in the midst of the injustices of his day cried out in words that echo across the gener generation. Let judgment run down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. As maladjusted as Abraham Lincoln, who had the vision to see that this nation could not exist half slave and half free. As maladjusted as Jefferson, who in the midst of an age amazingly adjusted to slavery, could cry out, all men are created equal and are endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As maladjusted as Jesus of Nazareth, who dreamed a dream, of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. God grant that we be so maladjusted that we will be able to go out and change our world and our civilization, and then we will be able to move from the bleak and desolate midnight of man's inhumanity to man to the bright and glittering daybreak of freedom and justice. This morning, Kobe and I collaborated to, um, to work on a community art project, which is on the back table. And what I'd like to have you do to contribute to that art piece is to think of a dream related to justice, to reconciliation of shalom in this world and in our, in our city. And so if you think of something, and just complete that sentence, I have a dream that, and then if you would, unfortunately my pens did not work this morning to write on the surface that we had planned. And so if you will, there are some cards that are at the back that you can write it out or just rip maybe part of the opportunity sheet and write down your thoughts. They'll be here next week too, so you can contribute then. But we're going to, to put together an art project that we'll have um, for, um, on the tables from this point on. And of your thoughts of what what is that dream that you can envision? And I would encourage you to make it specific. The one I thought of was, I have a dream that the worship hour on Sunday morning is the least segregated hour in, in, in our country. That's a dream. So if you would stand with me, let's transition in, into our worship time by reading Psalm, the Psalm together. Versus
remain standing and join us as we sing.
to uh, send our kids back to their designated area of learning. It looks like Lana will be leading that charge. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Harriet, for sharing that, uh, those uh, paragraphs from Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, just recently, if you're looking for a good place to start, if you don't know a lot or haven't read a lot of his writings, uh, a fantastic place to start is a little book called Strength to Love. Uh, it's a short collection of a lot of his uh, most well-known sermons that really give you an idea of, uh, of his philosophy and, and what his, um, really what he was about. Uh, it's a fantastic little book. So if you're looking to, to learn more uh, about Martin Luther King Jr., uh, that's a great book. Uh, well, good morning once again. Uh, I remember when our, our oldest son, Graham, was a few years old, and we started to try to wean him off of his pacifier. And, you know, I know some of you have children who loved pacifiers, um, who it was, it was a real struggle to figure out how to get them to grow up and to, to give those away. And I remember Graham uh, loved that thing maybe more than he loved us. Um, he slept with it. He, he wanted it, whether he was playing or in the car or, uh, you know, in bed, wherever he was at, he wanted that thing all the time. In fact, uh, he, would, he would have one in his mouth and he would hold one in each hand in case this one popped out somehow. And so sometimes we'd just, Kelly and I would just mess around uh, with him and he'd have these two, he'd be sitting on his bed, you know, just chomping away and we'd just pull it out and instantly he would just pop another one in. And then, you know, we would pull that one out and he'd pop the last one in. And then the final one he wouldn't let go of. But he would just hold it in his teeth and, and would like He loved these things. And so we had to start restricting his pacifier usage um, because, he, you know, you don't want to have your kid go to kindergarten with a pacifier, right? It's kind of, um, it's weird, to be honest, it's strange. But I'm sorry if your kids did that. I realize I gave you a thing some people here. But, um, so we're trying to help him to grow past relying and in finding comfort in the pacifier, so we started to restrict um, certain times of the day that he couldn't use it at all. Couldn't use it in the car or whatever, but we'd give him a couple times a day when he could have what he called binky time on his bed. He could, he could rest a little bit, he'd just sit there and chomp on that thing, and, and then we'd be done, and, and that was it. So, but eventually we had to get past that, we had to get rid of them all together, so I think we stole this story from somebody in here about how there were kids in the world, you know, there's like a binky shortage. <laughs> And there were kids in the world that needed binkies, and, uh, you know, it was time to let those kids have these binkies that you're hoarding, Grant. I think it was really a great story. So we, we put the binkies in the mailbox for the binky fairy to come overnight and to take them to these kids that, uh, what, what's wrong with this? <laughs> for these kids that didn't have binkies. And, uh, and then he got a, it was some kind of present or something for, like, giving it up. Um, you know, still, he went through binky withdrawals for a while, and still, like, six months later, out of the blue, one day, he just asked me, he's like, yeah, can I have my binky back? <laughs> it's like, been, like, six months, you know what I'm yet? But the point is, even though it was hard, he had to give it up for the sake of his own growth and development. It was hard, but he had to do it for the sake of his own growth and development. It was hard, but it was possible, it was necessary. Sometimes we just need to be pushed a little bit to grow up. We need to be challenged. And it seems like Jesus is very good at this, of knowing when to push, when to invite people into relationship, when to challenge. And today is one of, the, one of those challenging passages. But before we begin, I want to ask you, with this theme of giving something up, can you think of a time in your life that you had to give something up or walk away from something it was incredibly difficult, but you did it. What was that for you? And how did you do it? This is that non-rhetorical part of the morning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, what, what, what else? What else have you given up that was difficult? Yeah. I had to give up a relationship I was in, like in my 20s. I was just a six year long relationship and it was really fun. Yeah, six, six year long relationship in your 20s, yeah. That's, that would be incredibly difficult. People need to give up some more stuff. Let's give you some more stories. Bobby's got to have something. I gave up gluten, and I'm Swiss, and I love bread, and I love chocolate, and I had to give up bread, and that was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One of those things is fun. Yeah, at one point I found out that my family had run, like, uh, triglyceride levels. I didn't even know what these were. Run really high in my family. And it turns out, like, I don't eat that poorly. Mine were, like, 500-something. Supposed to be like 150. So I had to give up a bunch of stuff that I've probably recently been eating again. But a lot of sugar and processed stuff, pretty much everything that's good. I don't have to give up if I want to live very long. So that's been hard. Nobody else. I'm surprised you know my stories. Yeah. Major fail, Chris. Welcome. transition one uh, like I keep it's easy for me to keep dreaming about going back and re-engaging in it but now in my stage of my life it, it's not it's not I may never go back and it's been difficult to uh, uh, see the growth and the good in that sometimes but I think it's on yeah
Um, let me say before I read this, last time we were in Luke was in November before we started our Advent series. And if you remember, we were talking about what it looks like to enter the kingdom of God like a child. As someone who had very little social status, very little value in society at the time, that they were often overlooked. In other words, Jesus was, was teaching that the ones who could enter the kingdom were those who didn't approach it on their own merits. On their own status. I want you to keep that in mind because that story is meant to contrast with this one in terms of how we approach the kingdom. If we're supposed to approach the kingdom as a little child, this is the exact opposite of that. Uh, verse 18. Once a religious leader asked Jesus this question. Good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. The man replied, I've carefully obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Now let me, let me just stop there for a minute and ask, what is it about this, this brief exchange so far that, that catches your attention? What is it that sticks out? Anything seem weird in this story at all? Well, the religious leader called him good teacher. I mean, you know, assuming maybe that he wasn't a fan of Jesus, you know, but he calls him a good teacher. I mean, compared to all the other religious leaders that were around then. Yeah, so he calls him good teacher, which Jesus doesn't seem to care for very much. No. Maybe he was being sarcastic. And Jesus kind of mm -hmm. called him on it. Or trying to show respect, but still a little bit condescending, like he didn't see him in that same religious leader status that the Pharisees and other people would have had who were part of the system. Okay. Yeah, the religious leader actually asked a similar question, which is, uh, well, you know, doctors, we don't do that. I mean, we get answers, not, not ask questions. So that, that always interested me. Yeah. It makes me wonder, is this, a, is this an actual question? Mm -hmm. Do you really want to know, or is this a sad Yeah. Yeah, does he really want to know? <clears throat> you know, like you guys brought up, man, the, the fact that he calls Jesus good teacher, which Jesus doesn't really like, he kind of rebuffs the guy a bit. It may strike you as odd today, but, um, but maybe not. But, but in a more honor-shame culture, one commendation always deserved another. And so if you approach someone and said, you know, good teacher, this guy is essentially setting Jesus up to tell him what he wants to hear. He's, he's being a little manipulative. Well, if I address Jesus as good teacher, then surely he's going to tell me that I'm good in terms of my entrance into the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> he's kind of fishing for a good response, but Jesus lets the man know right away that his interaction won't be determined by society's values, which must have come as a surprise. But more than that, what, what strikes me is that if only God is good as Jesus affirms, you would think that the man would would hear that and would have to admit or show some kind of humility in regard to his keeping of God's commands. That it would drive them towards God's grace rather than wondering where he stands based on his own performance. But it doesn't. He wants to know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is it left on the checklist that I have to perform to get in? So Jesus lists some commands and kind of asks, well, how, how are you doing with these? And it's important to ask the question, well, why does Jesus cite the second half of the Ten Commandments? Isn't that kind of peculiar as well? Like, what was Jesus doing in focusing on the ones that, that talk about our love and, and our treatment of others? He doesn't even mention any of the ones that have to do with loving God. And I wonder why that is. Jesus heard his answer, he 
he said, there is still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Why do you think Jesus asked this guy to do what seems like a pretty extreme thing? What do you think Jesus is doing here? And what does this have to do with the law that he just talked about? Is your security based in God's call to follow, or is it based in your wealth and your status and your possessions? I think Jesus already has a pretty good idea which it is, which is why he, he asks a question that I think is really, like you're saying, I don't know if he's picking a fight, but he's certainly asking a question that's poking at an idol. And what Jesus does, I think why he does that is, is an expression of grace. He's giving this man an opportunity to reject his idol and to come experience true life with Jesus. He's offering him, I guess what we would see as an internship possibility of a lifetime. Sell your stuff and come learn how to live from me in complete dependence and reliance on God. It's important, though, that, that we don't miss this because Jesus didn't just tell the man to renounce his money, to empty his bank account. Or he, he never says that, you know, poverty is the ideal state. There's nothing particularly spiritual about an empty bank account, right? I've been poor plenty of times in my, in my life and didn't mean I was more spiritual than anybody else. But Jesus is asking him to dispose of his material goods for the sake of the poor, 
for the sake of those in need, not just to, you know, because it will do something for him. To use his resources as an expression of those loving his neighbor parts of the law. It's his first lesson in discipleship, of what discipleship means. And this is what I think is probably the most surprising thing at the part of this passage. Because we tend to think of what Jesus asked this particular man is pretty extreme. You know, if Jesus were to come to any of them and say, Rob, sell all your possessions. Get rid of all of them. And come follow me. And be like, what? That sounds crazy. <laughs> but this is the thing. We, we've, we've talked about this back in Luke 12. Jesus actually teaches this to all of his disciples. Do you remember this? He, he says in um, Luke 12, sell your possessions. He's talking to everybody here. To all potential disciples, sell your possessions and give it to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the curses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it. No moth can destroy it. Where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Jesus isn't asking this guy to do something that he hasn't already asked everybody else to do. What's easy to miss in a passage like this, particularly in our time and in having a hard time understanding their culture is that giving away money was almost always tied with enhancing your own honor in the community. You're not going to enhance your honor in the community by giving your money to the poor. That's not the way to increase your status in society. What does is giving your money away to someone who's going to put your name on the side of a building. That increases your honor in society. Only God would appreciate someone selling their stuff and giving money away to those who can give you nothing in return. That's a move that only God alone can appreciate. And so Jesus' is teaching is really rejecting this entire system of honor and power and inviting the man into a new way to live entirely. It's very radical. His first lesson of discipleship is to reject the world system. And to invest his money in what God cares about. And he says, and over time, what you care about will change as well. And so some of you know the story. You know how the guy responds. Verse 23 to 27 says this. But when the man heard this, he became sad. For he was very rich. When Jesus saw this, he said, and I love that he says this, presumably, in front of the guy who's sad. How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this said, then who in the world can be saved? Mark's passage says that they were astonished. They were full of wonder. They, their minds were blown. Who in the world can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible for people is possible with God. You know, I imagine it's got to be a painful realization. When you think that you've been this good religious person your entire life, that you've crossed your T's, you've dotted your I's, you've done all the right things, and then you discover through one painfully targeted question that your first priority in life has never been about God has never really been about the law or doing what God wants. But it's always been about me making myself a priority and putting security, my, my, my comfort, my faith in what I own, what I have. But it's never been about God's kingdom, it's been about my kingdom, my own wealth. But when you realize your faith has really just been a facade, you know, it's no wonder the guy is sad. Mark's Gospel tells us the man walks away, he leaves. He doesn't take Jesus up on his offer to follow him. Because parting with his idol would be too painful. And the problem is this, and this is important. He receives more from his idol than he thinks God can offer him. The rich man receives more from his idol 
his own security, his wealth, his status, than he thinks God can possibly offer him. And isn't that the way it is with any of our idols? In my, uh, this weird role as, as a pastor, it happens now and again, um, when you have to challenge someone's idol, when, when you can see something in a person's life that's clearly doing them damage, that's getting in the way from them loving God and loving one another. And uh, this has happened, you know, a variety of times over the years. And, and it's, it's, you always get an inter interesting response, whether you mean to poke at an idol or not. You get an interesting response because they either never talk to you again, they, you know, respond with repentance, which is great. Like, you're right, I, I need to, to get rid of this thing. Um, or they lash out and get angry. And, uh, and that's not pretty either. I, uh, just about a month ago, I, I touched a nerve with a young man who was a part of Evergreen a long time ago. He hasn't been around for, for a long time. He, he contacted me, and uh, he didn't want to talk to anyone in the church that he was presently a part of. He wanted to talk to me for some reason. And I think it's because he thought I would tell him what he wanted to hear. It's kind of a, a similar scenario in that sense. But he contacted me. He wanted some relationship advice coupled with exploring some, some questions on faith, and it became clear to me pretty early on in the conversation that his girlfriend means more to him than anything in the universe, including God. His girlfriend, this relationship, was, was a clear idol. And, uh, you know, he wanted to make their relationship work, but he was, he was letting this one walk all over him, even after she cheated on him. He was making excuses for her, which I, I, I'd never really heard before. Uh, well, it was my fault. It should have been, you know, all this stuff. And, and it, it was mind-blowing, the, the justifications that he made for her, the excuses that, and, you know, I sat there and I was like, this is a really pathetic scene. Like, this, it just sickens me to be a part of this. And so the third time I met with him, it was clear he wasn't really interested in the faith stuff as much as me encouraging him to continue in this relationship and, and all these things. And so um, the third time I decided to just to push a little bit. And I, I kind of challenged what I thought was this idolatry. I told him that he sounded miserable and that maybe he should consider breaking up with his girlfriend who obviously didn't care about him. Well, that was the last time I ever heard from him. Um, he, he hasn't emailed me back to, to continue to meet. Um, and I, I didn't say anything mean, I didn't say anything harsh. I just said what was should be abundantly obvious to any, any human being that was listening to this whole thing. But I touched a nerve, and you could tell. He kind of shut down after that, he didn't want to talk to me anymore, never emailed me again. Because I, I, I touched a nerve because I challenged an idol in his life. One that he is willing to keep, even at the expense of his own personal happiness. Doesn't that sound crazy? He's willing to hold on to this thing at the expense of his own personal happiness. It's amazing what people will sacrifice to hold on to an idol. And Jesus says, presumably, in front of this man to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, this uh, you know uses this image of a, of a camel going through the eye of a needle. This cartoonish picture of impossibility. The gravity of wealth has such a strong pull that embracing a world order that um, status distinctions are irrelevant on account of God's graciousness to everyone doesn't just happen. In fact, if, if Jesus says it's miraculous, it's something of God when it does. When someone who is rich embraces the kingdom of God, it is a miracle. It is a work of God. Because otherwise it's impossible. And remember, you know, when we talk about wealth here, the question is, well, you know, you ask, well, who's wealthy? What, what, who's Jesus talking about here? John the Baptist seemed to think that those who are wealthy is anyone with an extra coat. Anyone with some leftover food. Remember the beginning of the gospel? When John says, what was a sign of repentance? It's sharing a coat with someone who doesn't have one. That's the wealthy person. 
who has extra, who has extra that they can use to bless those who are in need around them. Those are the wealthy people. And, and Jesus says, it is impossible for those who have extra to inherit the kingdom of God without God doing something miraculous. We, that's something that, that we should ponder, that we should, we should meditate on. <clears throat> I think it's important to note, though, that Jesus also didn't say a couple of things here. He never said that the rich cannot enter the kingdom of God. He said that only with God's help can they enter the kingdom, which isn't that the only way any of us can enter the kingdom? With God's help? He also doesn't say here that the poor have, on a whole, any kind of advantage over the rich in, quote, being saved. He's simply upsetting this prevailing assumption about God and riches. How could God favor a person, however rich, who loves him less than they love their own wealth? Right, that that doesn't, doesn't make any sense. So the man responds with sorrow, and, and Jesus' disciples respond with incredulity. They're, they're outraged. They're astonished. Their mind has been blown. Who in the world can be saved then? If those who are rich and wealthy and powerful, those, those things that we see as a result of God's blessing on their life, if those people that we typically think of are, are blessed can't be saved, what hope is there for any of us? Jesus continues through the gospel to, to upset the social order. He's more in line with the prophets who criticize the rich for neglecting the poor <coughs> than he is for the more proverbial writings of those who associate God's blessing with those who are rich. The real question is, in all of this, is how do we respond to this story? I mean, what's the significance? We don't really understand a passage until we understand the significance for us today. And I wonder what that is. Is, is Jesus saying that we should all go make large withdrawals and empty our bank accounts to give the money to the poor? Is that is that the desired result of, of this morning? What do you think? I mean, what do we as a community do with a passage like this? Do you have any ideas? Any, any thoughts? I mean, obviously anytime you read <laughs> scripture, one of the questions you ask is, okay, who is this written for? I mean, is this like you read it and you go, this applies to anyone ever that reads it. You do exactly as that says. I mean, Jesus knew this guy's heart and exactly what he needed to hear and when he needed to hear it. You know, and that's, and, and so he lasered in on, you know, you, you got to get rid of your binky, you know, or you got to, you know, you got to get rid of the thing that is keeping you from getting to the next step. And, and for this guy, it was his, you know, his wealth. And he obviously, you know, got, went, get, got to his pride too. You know, when he, when, he, when he pointed these things out. So I think it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's not necessarily, I don't, I mean, in some ways it doesn't seem like it's necessarily just about wealth, but about what is the thing that, the idol that's keeping you from going to the next one, you know, growing in your relationship with God. Yes, yeah, so there's some real specificity with Jesus' targeted question yeah. for this man. Yeah. I know, obviously, Jesus, that it's a broader teaching to sell your possessions, to have concern for the poor with your own. But certainly, this, the specific command, why don't you go sell what you have and, and come follow me, it, it is targeted. There's kind of two things going on. There's the idolatry piece, there's the, the wealthy being concerned for the poor piece. And I feel like both of those things can be applicable. Maybe if, You're right, maybe God is asking you today to give up something else that has a stronghold that you're placing your dependence and trust in. And you know, it's funny, that happened to me a little bit earlier this year. Um, one of my, I feel like one of my idols, or one of those things that I get my identity from, or used to get my identity from, was um, knowledge and reading and, and being intelligent. I want you to all think I'm very intelligent. I want you to all know how many books I read a year. Like, those things were really important to me. And so what I love to do is, is I love to display my large collection of books for the world to see. And, and this may sound silly to you, I know. Um, 
But so so in what used to be my office, I mean, I had these sweet bookshelves. It's nothing compared to a friend of ours down in Miami that I that I lust over in a weird book way. But um, but I would walk in my office. I wanted the door to be wide open because I wanted people that when they were walking to the bathroom to see, wow, look at all these books that this guy maybe has read. Maybe. <laughs> And, uh, and I kind of realized earlier this year like, how unhealthy that is. And how I, I didn't really want my identity wrapped up in, in knowledge. And, and like, why do I care about that? Why do I care what you, what you people think of me? And so um, I thought about it actually a lot of times. I was like, I need to get rid of these books. And, and I was like, nah, that's crazy. For, for probably about a year. And then finally, um, this spring I, I, I ended up selling most of them. I Basically, I, my rule was whatever I can fit in the office, which is very small, on these two bookshelves are the books that I should keep. And I should get rid of the rest of these and, and make this office into some, we ended up making it into more of a playroom uh, for the boys. And it, it was surprisingly difficult, but also surprisingly freeing. But it's a moment just in, in thinking through this and the specificity of Jesus' commands of, of maybe it isn't money for you that holds such a, a grasp on your life or, or something that you find your identity in. Maybe it's something as silly as books. Maybe it's, maybe it's your, your career path. Maybe, what, is it, what is it that you, you want people to see as your identity? I feel like those kinds of questions are, are really valuable for identifying those idols in your life. So anyway, that's just a personal example that I didn't plan on sharing at all this morning um, that, that came to mind. What else do you think? What is Jesus asking of us this morning? Another question that you could ask yourself is what are you most afraid of losing? Yeah, what are you most afraid of? <laughs> afraid of in your life? You know, the, the truth is, like we said, it's not just about money. I think money is a big thing. But anything can be a barrier that gets in the way of us following Jesus and gets in the way of being aware and meeting the needs of those around us. Anything can be a barrier. We, we'll finish up the, the story here because uh, the disciples kind of want to know where they stand, which I don't, I don't blame them. Uh, verse 28, Peter said, we've left our homes to follow you. Yes, Jesus replied, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will be repaid many times over in this life and will have eternal life in the world to come. I love Peter here. He's kinda, he throws that out there as a way to like to, to test Jesus a little bit. Like, well, where do we stand? Like, we've left houses. What, you know, what's, what's, do we pass this test when we enter the kingdom? And so Jesus broadens this message to more than just money. But he says, anyone who has sacrificed any of these things to follow me will enter the kingdom, will experience the kingdom, and be repaid many times over. So he kind of distinguishes these disciples from this rich guy that failed the test. What the rich guy wasn't able to do through God's help, the disciples were. They sacrificed their comforts and securities to follow him. I, you know, I, I think prioritizing God and His kingdom will always require some sacrifice for us. In a variety of ways through life, I think that's true. And I think the question is, do we have the kind of trust, the kind of faith, to believe that what God offers us in this world and the next is more valuable than what it is He's asking us to give up? Do we believe that? Because the eyes of faith see sacrifice as, a, as an investment that yields an incredible return. What fool would turn down an investment opportunity where they're assured to return a hundred times what they what they sacrifice? Who would do that? It doesn't make any it doesn't make any financial sense. 
And that's what Jesus offers in his kingdom. Everything he sacrificed to prioritize loving God, taking care of others, all of that will be repaid many times over. And so Jesus teaches that we should get rid of everything and invest our lives in the kingdom. Because it's actually worth far more than what we currently have. Because of this generosity of our king who is, is lavishing every spiritual blessing on us in Christ. We can be confident that anything we commit to, to God will grow in his kingdom into this incredible source of blessing for others and eventually ourselves. You know, there's nothing really all that magical or spiritual about emptying our bank accounts. We're not trying to, we're not trying to buy or, or to earn our salvation in some way. What we're looking at is a difference between receiving the kingdom like a child and not being able to receive it like the rich man. And you see this contrast and you kind of wonder, well, what's the difference between the two? And the answer is pretty easy to see. One trusts in their social status, and their wealth, and their possessions, and their performance. And one has nothing to trust in but God's radical goodness and grace alone. Jesus assures his disciples that they pass the test, not because they literally sold everything, but because the direction of God became their, their central orientation for their lives, and it showed by what they sacrificed. It showed by what they were willing to give up and leave behind. And it's interesting because part of the disciples' reward for sacrificing for those in need is found in the community of believers that gather together to support each other in our sacrifice. You remember how this plays out in the book of Acts as this early community is forming. We read that all the believers were united in heart and mind. And they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them. Because those who owned land or houses would sell them. And bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Isn't that amazing? In the community, that's where we find the replacement for whatever has been lost. Among the sacrificial, loving, and caring community are, are people who will mother us and father us, who house us, who share out of their abundance into our need. And I think that's a picture of the blessing of sacrificing for the kingdom. Those who give shall receive both in the present and the future. And I wonder as you hear this story today, what is it that you possess that God might be asking you to give up, that could be used in, in service of the needs of others around you? What is it that Jesus may be calling upon you to give up for the sake of others? I feel like that's our question today. That's what we need to figure out. I want to invite you to communion after this honking stops.
All are welcome to the table. Who wants what God offers us? Let's pray and have a seat. God, we confess to you that there are so many things in life that we do put our, our confidence and our faith in. We put our faith in our, our status, our homes and our cars and our relationships and our money and our bank accounts, our jobs. But God, we realize that all of those things are fleeting. We can lose any of those in a second. It's not a firm foundation to place our trust. And so we, we come to you asking for your help. God, when you, when you pry our hearts off of those things that we attach ourselves to that, that don't last, that don't lead us into greater communion with you, God, thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for doing what we couldn't do. God, as we sing today, we give you incredible thanks for your graciousness, your patience, and your continued love for all of us.
Continue to reveal in us um, the ways that we can give ourselves up for you, the things that we can turn over to you. And will we keep remembering that that isn't our job, but it's what you've already done for us on the cross and allows us to be in a relationship with you like that. We're so grateful for you and for the love that you have given to us and never runs out. We ask these things in the name of you. Y'all just grab a seat for a moment. As we wrap up, we want to just highlight some opportunities, some things that are coming up soon. Uh, where is Paige? Paige, come tell us what's going on with us. <laughs> I, I like the round of applause and the fire board. <laughs> by tomorrow morning. So you can sign up there. If it's the night before, you forgot what you brought, I'll update it, and then I'll bring a print out next Sunday to see where the holes are. Um, in addition, I'm going to take this as a plug time. Um, since our last meal service in December, um, I talked to Brother Bruce and I said, you know, what else do you need in your community? So every Wednesday morning, I've been serving with him and um, another person in his organization. We meet at a different cross street about 6 a.m. and we take coffee and hot chocolate and whatever donations we have. And we just, we offer breakfast, we offer a conversation, um, a pair of socks, whatever you can give. And sometimes that leads to people who need help, they need resources, they need a prayer, they need a hand to hold, um, and, and Bruce can provide that. Sometimes people don't want anything, and that's fine too. So, um, if you are interested, we always need things for that Wednesday morning service to, to go out and uh, offer. I have a list on the table. I can tell you what works, what doesn't work um, in terms of like sandwiches, Pop-Tarts, fruit, um, kind of some specifics because there are some things that don't work. So if you're interested, you can bring those things here on Sunday and then I'll take them Wednesday morning. If you're interested in participating in that, um, we keep the group small because we are going into the camps and we, we don't like to go in with a big force. Um, these are people's homes. And uh, we have to be very careful about, you know, entering their space. Um, but we do need some help every once in a while. Bruce has some evening opportunities down at Pioneer Square. So if you are looking to get more involved, um, email me, let me know. I'll post some things on the table. Um, but it's a great way to kind of meet our friends outdoors and, and learn a little bit more about who they are and, and what we can do for them. So right. thank, you. thank you. Oh, crock pots. I have two from last time. They're back there. Um, I don't have a lot of storage, so I'll bring them out for next time. But I'm going to eventually have to either ask for storage or donate. So please grab your car pods. Um, because uh, otherwise, I own a lot of car pods. All right. Cool. Thank you, Paige. Uh, and if you're wondering what this table is that we are talking about, if you go to our website, evergreenpdx.org, scroll all the way to the bottom on the left-hand side, there's a link to something called The Table. It's our kind of online community thing where we post news and discussions and, and whatnot for the community. Uh, there is no new people's group today. If you're looking at the announcement sheets, uh, we had that listed. We are not doing that today. We're actually going to postpone a little bit until uh, uh, sometime in February, March, just so we have... Uh, more time with folks and, and yeah. <laughs> because there's a football game. <laughs> I don't know what to say. All right. Uh, remember when we were a church that didn't care about sports? What happened? What happened to those people? What did they? I don't know. Anyway, I guess some of you still don't care. Anyway, it's just Dustin. Uh, Racial Justice Group, if you are interested in that, you can read about it and then talk to Harriet uh, right up here. It would be great. Please make a point to come to Ash Wednesday. This is kind of the beginning of our Lent season. 
uh, and that will be February 18th. It's how we kick off Lent, and that season ends with Easter, so it's a great time to begin to focus our minds on uh, what's happening during that season. And as we said, what we get is coming up. Jason, Jason, where's Jason? Do you have books for people? Yeah. If you ordered a copy of the Live Justly book, Jason has those for you and would be happy to give them to you. Last but not least, we need help in putting the space back together. Now, this is this, listen very carefully. This is really important because the last couple of weeks we we kind of got it right, but not quite. And I was asked to massage this a little bit for you. So here's what we're going to do. If you have kids in the kids' room, go get them. If you don't have kids in the kids' room, stay out here and chat for a few minutes. After about five minutes, then we can all pick up the chairs, and they all have to go back that way. Okay, so don't don't get up right away and take the chairs in there because there are small children and, and you will run over them. So if you have kids, go pick them up, um, and then in five minutes we will put the chairs away. Otherwise, please hang out with one another, uh, invite each other over to see the football game, go out to lunch if you're not into that. If you would stand, I will bless you. Evergreen, this week, may you know that what God offers you is better than what he asks you to lay down. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.